Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. And what do we have today? Something a little bit different. Most of you should remember the uh, sit down I had with my good friend Joe Pagliarulo, the radio show host, big syndicated radio show host across the country. I sat down with him and Rudy Giuliani. It was a great, I think, two part series that we had. You all loved it. A lot of great comments, appreciated very much. Well, today, same format, my dear friend Joe Pagliarulo is hosting myself and Curtis Sliwa. If you don't know who Curtis is, he was the founder of the Guardian Angels. It was kind of like a vigilante group on the right side of the law that was formed back in 1979, really to fight street crime in New York, which was at an all-time high. It was the era that I grew up in in the city. And believe me, people may not have liked what he was doing, but he kind of took the law into his own hands. They didn't go armed with guns, but they did their best to clean up the city, try to work with law enforcement if they could. It was a whole battle going on. Curtis will tell you about it. So as the Republican nominee, because the city is in bad shape and Curtis is feeling, hey, I got to go back to my old ways in some way. and We got to clean up this city. Curtis is feeling that it's his responsibility now to come and clean up this city again. And uh, he's running for mayor of New York. So here we go. Joe Pagliarulo, Curtis Sliwa, and yours truly, Michael Francis. to have you along for the ride. Thanks a lot for stopping by. Another historic sit-down, and, and Michael, I'm going to take your term there if you don't mind. It's Michael Franzese, the former Capo regime with the Colombo crime family in New York, and also Curtis Lewa, uh, the, the founder of the Guardian Angels, and also now the Republican nominee for New York City mayor. Thank you both so much for coming on. Appreciate you. Thanks for having us. You know, th- this is historic for me because you're both about the same age. Michael, you're a little bit older, not much. You're both from Brooklyn. One went one way, one went the other way. L- l- let me start from when I think we, we, the general public watching and listening would, would have noticed you, if you don't mind. And Michael, let me start with you. You, you told me you were made, a made man, uh, Halloween Day, 1975. So you were in the family business at that point, on the street, as you say, as somebody in the mob. You, you took a, a direct left turn from where Curtis took a right turn. F- fill me in on that era of New York City, that era of crime in New York City, if you don't mind. Well, you know, I got involved uh, really in 1970. You know the story with my dad, Joe. He got a, a 50-year prison sentence. He went off to prison in 1970. Shortly after that, Joe Colombo who we were very close with, my dad was his underboss, uh, started the Italian American Civil Rights League. And I got involved, you know, picketing on 69th Street and 3rd, 3rd Avenue. We were picketing the FBI building. From there, I started to meet a lot of my dad's friends. And, you know, the direction of my life changed from college student, pre-med student, to now wanting to get on the street to help my dad get out of what we thought was, a, was a, uh, an illegitimate uh, conviction and sentence. So that's how it started for me. And, you know, you know, I always say the 70s and 80s, right up until the mid, uh, you know, 80s, when Giuliani started to really uh, enforce or use, I would say, the racketeering law. You know, those were kind of the golden years of the, of the mob life there. And, uh, you know, the 70s was not a good era for New York. I mean, there was a lot of crime during that time. And, uh, you know, I recall that. And uh, I certainly remember Curtis uh, quite a bit, you know, with the Guardian Angels. You know, I followed him at that point in time. Obviously, different directions, but uh, we actually appreciated in some part what he was doing for the uh, just the street crime that was going on. I find it to be so odd. The mob appreciated Sliwa. The mob also, in some ways, uh, a very patriotic group of people that you, you happen to cap people every once in a while if you had to, and you ran rackets and everything else. That's very interesting. Now, Curtis, growing up in Brooklyn, you had to know some mob guys or mob-connected guys. Why, why did you take the path you took? Uh, not only did I know them, I taught them stickball. I ended up becoming commissioner of stickball, which is a New York City street game when Rudy Giuliani became mayor. But I actually taught uh, Joey Testa, Anthony Centaur, Patty Testa to play stickball on 89th and J in Canarsie. 
which was the heartland of Lucchese and Gambino activity. In fact, at that time when I was growing up, uh, Michael had mentioned Joe Colombo. He was coming over for a community meeting. It was mostly made up of Italian and Jewish people living in Canarsie, the Jews who had escaped from Brownsville, the Italians from East New York. And at the desk was Paul Ivario of the Lucchese crime family taking the names, taking attendance. Joe Colombo came, gave a tremendous presentation. None of those D's and uh, and Dems and Do's. This guy was well-spoken. And it was across the street from the infamous bamboo lounge that you see in Goodfellas being torched. But it wasn't uh, in Ozone Park or Howard Beach. Uh, It was right there in Canarsie on Avenue N and Rockaway Parkway. And I remember when it got torched. Well, Pauly, but but was Pauly Vario the, was the, the boss in Goodfellas, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a Lucchese uh, boss. And they basically divided uh, up Canarsie between Lucchese's and Gambino's. In some instances, you'd have a social club on Avenue L, which was a commercial strip on one side, Gambino's. On the other side, Lucchese's. And they got along. And in fact, oftentimes, as I had mentioned, the Testa brothers, uh, Joey Testa, Patty Testa, Anthony Centaur, they went from being Gambinos to Lucchese's and back and forth. There was a lot of synergy at that time. But I was always on the outside looking in because my name was not I was half Italian on my mother's side, part A's. Uh, my last name is Polish. And so they would say, Polish? You're, you're from Polish? No, no, no. No, you <laughs> Jadru, you knuckle draggers. Poland, Polish, my father's last name. It's so a, I was constantly. Battling these guys. It's funny because my grandfather came from from Bari. Uh, I'm about to say as well. Pagliarulo, Pagliarulo uh, is also uh, from that region. When you grow up in the neighborhood, I played stickball, but I was on Long Island. I wasn't in Brooklyn. I was well, Brooklyn's on Long Island, but that's a long story. But but I wasn't in the city per se, so I didn't have that sort of uh, um, um, energy from the mob, from crime, from good, from the cops. I mean, there, there really had to be this pull. The magnet pulled you, Michael, one way. It pulled you, Curtis, the other way. But let me break it down with you, Michael, was it strictly because your dad was Sonny Franzese? Was that just because you grew up, that was the life you knew, and there was no path like Curtis took? Yeah, that's it. I mean, look, I, I knew the life from uh, from the time I was a baby. I mean, I, I remember, Joe, one thing I remember distinctly, I was probably, I don't know, five, six years old, and uh, it was during the gallo Profaci War. My father had been gone for a couple of days because they went to the mats, you know, the mattress, as, as they say. And uh, he comes home, and we were at my grandmother's house. I was sitting on the step. He walks in the door. He hadn't shaved in days. And uh, one of his guys, Joey Brancata, who was another maid guy, was standing out you know, front on the porch, making sure that nobody had followed my dad in at the time. So, I mean, that was my earliest realization that my father was into something different. I was a kid. Right. But then, you know, I grew up, and you know the deal with my father. He was heavily, heavily investigated, always surveilled. So we had, you know, I had that environment my whole life, but that's not the life that I wanted to get into. You know, we left Brooklyn, uh, you know, when I was about 11, 12 years old, grew up in Greenpoint. And by the way, you know, in Greenpoint, uh, Curtis, there was the Italian section and then the Polish section. You know, there was kind of a dividing line, but we all got along. It wasn't one of the issues then. But, uh, you know, I was going to be a doctor. I was an athlete, going to be a doctor. And my dad didn't want me involved in the life. But during the 60s, you know, he was on trial three times. Once for murder, two other times for grand larceny. Then he goes on the bank robbery case. So, I mean, that was our whole 60s. The whole decade was was fighting my father's case, in and out of jail. And then we get close to Joe Colombo, and my whole direction changes. But, no, I didn't I didn't want to be part of that life from the time I was a kid. But, but was your dad quite literally, Michael, was he the good guy? And by the way, it's Michael Franzese. Uh, go to michaelfranzese.com. Great website. Join his crew. It's also uh, Curtis Sliwa. Make sure you go to um, sliwa4ny.com. Sliwa4ny.com. I pray that you're the next mayor, Curter, uh, C- Curtis. I just think that the city needs you right now. Michael, were you under the impression, though, when you were a kid like that, that your dad was the good guy? And that the good guys you found out eventually were the cops and people like Curtis, they were the bad guys? Did you have it completely 180 when you were growing up? 180, Joe. I hated the police. I hated law enforcement because I loved my dad. And I saw my dad, he was my hero. He was my idol. And I always saw law enforcement as harassing him and, and harassing our family. You know, we had, we had many encounters. You know, some of them got out of hand every once in a while. I understand they were doing their job, but it was just the environment that I grew up, the mentality that I had growing up. 
And I, I understood later on that it was wrong, but uh, that's the way I grew up. You know, they were the enemy. Uh, Curtis, what was the magnet that told you I've got to clean up the streets? Because when you're around dynamic people like Sonny Franzis and Michael Franzis and Paul Ivari and all these guys, how do you not get sucked into that? Well, you know, I'll tell you a story. I met uh, Michael's father, Sonny, at Ring 8. This is a club of old altacockers who loved fighters. And they would go to Long Island City. It was called the uh, Waterfront Crab House. And they would sit and talk to the old fighters. And I'm talking to your dad, Michael, about Rocky Graziano, that my grandfather, Fidel Bianchino, loved. Rocky Graziano. Your, your father knew everything about Rocky Graziano. I'm talking about Jake LaMotta. A lot of people don't realize Jake LaMotta was the toughest Jewish guy ever. His mother was Jewish. That made him Jewish. Everyone thought, oh, he's Italian. And I would, I would bust their bubble and say, oh, I hate to disagree <laughs> with you, but his mother was Jewish. That's the toughest Jewish guy. So we'd be talking, and Sonny, strong supporter of boxing like a lot of, a lot of other non boxers And then there was a moment, some guy came up to your father and whispered something in your ear, and your father went ballistic on him. <laughs> I'm like, look at this guy. He's like, oh. He's like the raging bull right here. I thought he was going to put on some gloves and knock the guy's schnoz down his throat. That was my first exposure to Sonny. Now, I heard of his reputation, and but I never, when you first heard him talking about boxing, never, never would assume. And here's a guy who would like be a professional in terms of what he was doing, in terms of taking you out and disposing of your body. That's why I mentioned the guys that I grew up with were part of Roy DeMeo's wrecking crew, Patty Tester, Joey Tester, Anthony Centaur. They ended up probably slicing and dicing Khashoggi style upwards of 200 victims on Troy Avenue at the Gemini Lounge. When I used to run in the lots of Canarsie with this guy and we'd try to shoot rats and blackbirds with like a 22 and BB guns, I remember Patty Tester closed his eyes and shot in the air and the blackbird fell because we never hit anything. And he was crying like a little bambino, a little baby. And then this guy became a hardcore psycho killer. And that was because of the cocaine at the time. I mean, these guys were doing cocaine. Yeah. It made them paranoid, schizophrenic, and they were stone cold killers. Well, well how in '79? Actually, Michael, if you don't mind, I mean, you, you have any sort of a, a, a comments about what he just said? You were you were smiling, you were shaking your head. You you were familiar with all this stuff he was just talking about. Oh, absolutely. I mean, DeMeo's crew, they were, you know, they had a they had a reputation, let's put it that way. And, I, you know, I certainly met them throughout my time in there. And, you know, Patty Testa, they, they, were, they were tough guys. And that Gemini Lounge was, uh, you know, it was legendary, even for us on the street. We knew what was going on there. But that was a tough crew. You know, and the fact that Curtis didn't get involved in that obviously was, was probably one of the best things that happened to him. But And also about my father, you know, I seen him, he, he had a hairline trigger at times, but you know, they called my dad a chameleon because he could be the epitome of that life when he needed to be. And then on the other side, he was a perfect gentleman. He was intelligent. I mean, he, he really was, he, he was kind of the guy that set the standard for that life and what it should be like, I, at least in my opinion. And I don't think I'm biased because I've met so many guys. And you know, you, you also mentioned uh, Joe Colombo. Joe is another very knowledgeable, learned guy. You know, he spoke well. You know, these were the guys on top that really knew how to handle themselves properly. They were, Joe, really what the life was all about. I have to say that. It's Michael Franzese, former copper regime, the uh, Colombo crime family. His, uh, his website is michaelfranzese.com. He's now a pastor, born-again Christian, a great guy, a motivational speaker, business owner. He's the guy and has a huge presence over on YouTube. Go check out his YouTube channel and also go to michaelfranzese.com. Uh, Curtis Lee, you are running for the, the mayor of New York, great talk show host, the founder of the Guardian Angels in 1979. Go to sliwa4ny.com. Go support his candidacy. So, Curtis, in 1979, when you put together the Guardian and angels, which I don't know how you how you did it with no arms. I mean, you had arms, but you you guys weren't armed. Um, and you said we're going to take on crime. We're not vigilantes. We just love the city. You often tell me that that you bleed NYC, you know, red, white, and blue. So, what makes you think that you can put together a crime fighting organization with a bunch of guys with berets on and be as successful as you were? And were you at all mindful of what the mob was doing in New York at the time? Oh, you couldn't escape what the mob was doing because it was Fear City. They had complete control of all the rackets, uh, private sanitation, 
uh, you name it, even just from getting knives sharpened to getting uh, linen done. I mean, they, they were getting a piece of the action on everything and they were making it well known that they were in control. And remember, they were celebrated figures written about in the newspapers. They were on television. And so there was a fear of them. And so I come out of Canarsie, Howard Beach, East New York, where there was a legacy of them. And they'd always tell me, oh, you know, the neighborhood was so much safer or when it, the mob controlled it. I said, what are you talking about? People were having their trucks broken into, cars were being stolen left and right. I said, look, we used to joyride in cars that we were hot wire and then we'd park them to the side and the person who had them eventually would recover them. There was probably no damage. Right. But then right. they elevated it. A guy like Roy DeMeo would encourage my friends all of a sudden. He said, hey, what are you, what are you hot wiring that old 88 for, you know, a joyride? Hey, those parts are valuable. Here's an address. If you can find this make and model, the IROC Camaro. You can bring that to this location on Avenue D. There's a lot of moolah shmoolah. There's a lot of shimolis for you. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, my friends, they were abandoning ship. Next thing they had on the polyester, waffle weed, flame retarded pants, and, and the, you know, the platform shoes. They were at discos, Romeo and Juliet's, 2001 Space Odyssey, doing lines of cocaine, chasing skirts. And there was no more stickball, boxball, Johnny on the Pony, Buck, Buck, Queen Olivio for them. Right. It was all about cash and chasing trim. And, and at that point, you said, I have to do something about this. I can slow it. Well, well, Michael, let me ask you to respond to that. Did the mob really feel like the streets were safer when you guys were in control? Or you, you gave the impression that it was safer as you were collecting the, the protection money? How did that work? Yeah, our neighborhoods were safe. I mean, you know, I remember growing up in Greenpoint, you know, you leave your doors open, your windows open, you know, you didn't have to lock them. I mean, my sister would come home 12, 1 in the morning. People would surround her and make sure she got home okay. So, I mean, our own neighborhoods were safer. You know, what we were doing on the outside was a little bit different, but our neighborhoods were safe. But, you know, just to add something to what uh, Curtis said, I had a, uh, in the 70s, I had uh, some apartments in Glen Oaks because I had a big construction job that I was doing there. We were the GCs. I had the union. We controlled the union. And I had two Jaguars parked outside of the, uh, the apartment complex. And one morning I come up and they're both gone, right? They're stolen. So I made a few phone calls because I knew DeMeo and his crew, you know, were, were hijacking these cars. And uh, by about four o'clock that afternoon, I got them both back. But, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, he, they, they were taking cars left and right at that time, you know, all the valuable ones. But, you know, you know, again, I mean, I guess because I was part of it, I didn't look at, I mean, we weren't part of the street crime. At least we didn't feel we were. I mean, you know, I was in a little different category, too. I wasn't out there hijacking trucks and doing things like that. I had more of a, of a business mind. And I was, you know, I was defrauding banks. I was doing things like that. Obviously, you know, I defrauded the government on you know, that whole gas tax scheme. But, yeah, there was guys on the streets running around doing things, you know, like Curtis described. I mean, you can't, uh, can't sugarcoat that. It was happening, no doubt. It is uh, Michael Franz. Uh, uh, yeah, Curtis, go ahead. Just to mention what Michael was saying about stealing cars, I remember one time being with Patty, Joey Testa, Anthony Centaur. They stole the Eldorado. Back then, Cadillacs, Fleetwoods, Eldorados, that was the bomb to steal that. Take it to their chop shop, which was over near the Canarsie Market, change the VIN numbers, you know, just recustomize it, sell it to some Gavon. Then they would follow the Gavon who would drive it to his place of business, usually like a fruit market or, or some kind of retail establishment. And then they'd freaking steal the car again, bring it back oh, to the chop shop, and then sell it to some other Gavon. And they wow. used to do this, and they get their jollies off from doing this. So, so when you put, uh, let me again say who you're hearing for those who are listening on the radio. It's Curtis Sliwa, Sliwa4ny.com, Sliwa4ny.com. Support his candidacy. He's running for mayor of New York City. I hope he wins. Also the founder of the Guardian Angels, great talk show host. On the other side, it's Michael Franzese, former copper regime, the Colombo crime family, now a pastor, now a motivational speaker, an author, a movie maker. He does it all. Uh, go to michaelfranzese.com and become a, a member of his crew. So, so it was circular crime that was going on that they were causing the themselves and it kept them in the money constantly and obviously kept the money flowing in you made the decision in 1979 enough is enough so so how do you start that do you, do you start it thinking to yourself i've got to cut down on the crime in my city we got to go after the mob was it all in one crime is crime doesn't matter who's doing it and what made you think you could succeed well i was in the heart of the hood uh the bronx the south bronx so 
the Italians lived over near what we call the neck, Throg's neck. You had, uh, hello, gorgeous Vinnie Bassiano, who was a hairstylist and was like one of the upper echelon of the banana crew at that time. And then you had Arthur Avenue in Belmont, the little Italy section. But I was in the heart of the hood, predominantly black and Hispanics. Crime was off the hook. There was arson. It was abandoned buildings. There were youth gangs. All who were wearing these cutoff Lee jackets with rockets and patches, savage skulls, savage nomads, black skulls and black spades. And I was a night manager of Mickey D's. And I'd have to take the train late at night all the way back to Brownsville. Never ran, never will. Not far from where Mike Tyson grew up. That was a rough neighborhood. And I remember on the trains, there'd be these guys. They'd be uh, singing doo-wop and a cappella in the wee hours in the morning. And I'd say, oh, wow, you know, subway music, right? I couldn't be more hopelessly wrong. They would come into the subway car. They had the name buckles at that time. They turned around, sheepskin coats, the kangos on their head. And they'd be screaming at everyone, Manhattan makes it and Brooklyn takes it. Wow. And then they would scope <laughs> in on you. And if you punked out, if all of a sudden they, they saw you getting scared, they would surround you. And like a scene out of Clockwork Orange, they beat the hell out of you and then take what few valuables you had. I always would preemptively strike. Yeah. Having grown up, having to run through the phalanx of all these wannabe mobsters in Canarsie, I realized you better hit first, hit them so hard, their mother feel the vibrations, and then get the hell out of there. Because once you're on the ground, they give you a beat down, boots to the back of your head. You know, your head would be spinning as if you had vertigo. So I used the very same tactics on the trains and then eventually encouraged black, Hispanic, whites, Asians to join me. And that's how the patrol began. But you said we were labeled as vigilantes, hell's angels. Right. I got locked up 76 times in the first 13 years of running the Guardian Angels. And when Rudy Giuliani got elected mayor in 1992 and gave the city a badly needed colony, he called off the police who were harassing us. So as Michael says, I didn't grow up liking cops. I got wooden shampoos, concrete facials, uh, attitudinal readjustments. Uh, I laugh when they talk about going to jail, you know, all the uh, progressive uh, Democrats now. I was on Rikers Island. I was locked up in all these joints, 40 guys to a dormitory looking to give me a beat down all the time. And I would say, hey, CEO, uh, Am I going to get arraigned yet? They said, don't worry about it. We're not up to S yet, Sliwa. You, you still got some time in here. That was rough with a capital R. It's uh, Curtis Sliwa, Sliwa4ny.com. Uh, Michael Franzese, MichaelFranzese.com. Uh, Michael, did, were you aware of the Guardian Angels when they started? Have, have you and Curtis met before right now, by the way? Do you guys know each other? I was on Curtis' show a couple of years back on a radio nice. show. Yeah. So, so uh, but, but when, when the, that, when the Guardian met. Angels started, does the mob take any notice at all or, eh, whatever? Uh, it, I mean, what, what, how long did it take before there was an impact made in organized crime by the fact that there were some good guys on the street really looking to stop crime? Yeah, we, we took notice. I mean, I, I don't remember the exact timing, but you got to understand this. You know, as far as I can remember, now I don't know if Curtis had any other, you know, uh, um, instances, but... We were never against the Guardian Angels. You got to understand something. We didn't like street crime if we weren't doing it because we had wives and daughters and relatives and yeah. families. And, you know, you got to understand, Curtis described the Bronx was a war zone. I mean, we used to go there to, you know, dump people there and get rid of it. was a war zone back then. And the whole city was in bad shape, you know, until Giuliani came in. And so what Curtis was doing, we appreciated it in a way. I never heard any, any negative stuff about uh, the Guardian Angels, honestly. Like, again, you know, maybe he heard it from elsewhere, but certainly the, the circle that I was surrounded in, we didn't say anything bad about them. We appreciated what they were doing. Michael, such a mob mentality. I mean, think about what you just said. We didn't like street crime unless we were doing it. That's it's just and you're I know that your perspective is so different now. Right. I mean, you live your life in such a pristine way and I appreciate our friendship. But my God, can you can you remember having that perspective? We're against street crime unless we're doing it. Come on. Yeah, you know, I can. And I got to be honest, just listening to Curtis, this is very nostalgic for me because it brings me back to that era. You know, when you're out of it for so long, you're not thinking about it. But when I hear Curtis, the way he talks and obviously he lived it and it's it's very nostalgic, but he's right on everything he's saying. I mean, it was it was a tough place. I will tell you this. I came into New York. The federal marshals were bringing me in for a hearing. I think it was 94, 95. I don't remember exactly. But um, we were we had to go to court 
and we were early. So I asked the marshals, we were in the car, I said, hey, we got some time before we got to appear? They said, yeah. I said, drive me around the city. I haven't been here in a while, right? I'm out in California. I was doing all that jail time. And uh, we go into Times Square. I said, I want to do two things. Drive me around the city, and I want to uh, get a really decent cup of coffee here. You know, we hadn't had coffee in the coast like that. And they drove me through Times Square, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how Giuliani had cleaned up Times Square. Joe, when I grew up, it was smut city. I mean, that's all it was. You know, my whole life I knew it as that. And when I saw what he did to it and how he revitalized it, I mean, that was the first indication to me that, wow, this guy is doing an amazing job. And prior to that, remember, Giuliani was my enemy, tried to put me in prison for 50 years. So I even appreciated the job that he was doing as mayor. So the point is, we didn't want to see guys on the street committing crimes. We didn't want all that. Again, unless we were doing it, you know, we wanted the city cleaned up. That is Michael Franzese, michaelfranzese.com. Also, Curtis Lewa here, slewa4ny.com. Go and support his candidacy. So, so, Curtis, is that what it was? The sea change between the cops hating you guys and then you working in conjunction with the cops once Giuliani came into office, then you could really sort of clean the city up on steroids. What Michael saw certainly was a reflection of Giuliani and Bernard Carrick and, and I'm guessing also you. Was that sort of the triumvirate that was made, you, Bernie, and, and, and Rudy, uh, where you work together, because why why you have an animosity based relationship with the cops if you're cleaning up the streets? I I never understood that. Well, actually, uh, he was U.S. Attorney in the Southern District at the time, Rudy. He hadn't been elected mayor yet, uh, and as you remember, he took out the five heads of organized crime. Right. And we used to talk because I had had wars with the uh, Gambinos, especially the Gaddis and uh, the Castellanos, because. Going way back in Canarsie, my grandfather, Padres, his name was Fidelo Bianchino. He told me a story about my mother, Francesca, who was the last drop, the 13th child of his and Nicoletta, wow. born in America. Everyone else was born in Andria, in Italy, in uh, Bari. And my mother had rheumatic fever. At that point, they thought that it was like an aorta exploding. They would keep kids sitting right in a stable condition. They couldn't run around. And they would drink bone marrow soup. They felt that that was the remedy. Wow. So my grandfather went to Paulie Castellano's butcher shop. Yes, the Paulie Castellano got whacked, the head of organized crime. He was a regular butcher at the time. And he said, please, please, Paisamoy, I just need a few of the bones. I'll pay you for the bones. I need to make marrow soup. And he said, why should I sell it to you? I could sell it to the munitions plants. They make gunpowder, make far more money. Get the hell out of here. Wow. So my grandfather said, that, that's Fachim, that's Ski Fulsa. So that was built into me, my hate of the Gaddis and the Castellanos and the Gambinos that eventually led me to the point where I was broadcasting on WABC when John Gotti Sr. was on trial for the last time. And little did I realize they give him an AM radio. He's listening to it in lockup before they take him to court every day. And actually he's hearing me tell all these stories about what the Gambinos have done, Rockaway and Fulton in East New York, what I remember. <laughs> oh. And he tells the underboss, his uh, son, John Jr., you better shut that guy up. He's talking too much smack about you, your sister, the family, the business, the Gambinos. So he said the international, I call it the international uh, baseball bat wheeling crew, McLaughlin, the Irishman. Uh, they had uh, uh, Kaplan, who was the Jewish guy, and, uh, and an Italian guy with him. And they beat me to a pulp. Wow. I remember seeing Joe DiMaggio's signatures on the Louis, uh, uh, Louisville Sluggers. It hit me 38 times, almost turned me into a vegetable, but luckily I was able to escape. They figured out he'll learn his lesson. He'll shut up. He won't say anything more. I got back on the radio after they broke my, uh, my elbow. Oh, and I told the story of how John Gotti Jr. had killed somebody in the Silver Fox Lounge. My cousin Butchie, who was a lush, had watched it, and I decided that's it. We're going to settle all scores. So I talked about an open murder case John Gotti Sr. goes absolutely eclectic, tells his son, you better whack this guy now. They go to the Carrazos and Canarsie, who I grew up with, Jojo Carrazzo and little Nick Carrazzo, uh, who were running the family there, the Gambinos. And they said, my father wants you to take out Sliwa. And they said, with delight. We never liked him, you know, when he was a little punk in Canarsie. And that's when they put together the, uh, the hit team. They tried to kill me. Uh, a guy named Michael Leonardi, who was from Canarsie, D'Angelo, who was the protege of Sammy the Bull Gravano, 
And uh, their intention was to make sure that I'd be swimming with the fishes in nearby Jamaica Bay. But luckily, I was able to escape after getting shot with five hollow point bullets. But it was like a vengeance. It was a blood feud between me and them over the years. And it traces back to my grandfather being thrown out of Paulie Castellano's butcher shop because he was trying to help my mother who had rheumatic fever. I had no idea. In fact, I look at him straight down in hell where I know he went uh, without an asbestos suit and say, Paulie, you are a spachi. You are a skifosa. (laughs) That's how it's burnt into the embers of my soul. It's a story that that many wouldn't believe even if if they saw it in a movie, but it's verifiably true. Michael, we've talked about this many times that um, you generally don't go after the cops. If you're in the mob, you generally don't go after journalists. You you know, this is something the, the Mexican cartels do. Um, you generally leave them alone. Why did you know this story about about Paul Castellano being the butcher and this whole backstory? And maybe that's where the bad blood started with Slee. because I know that you knew about the the attempted hit on him. But did you know all this other stuff? You know, I didn't know the backstory, uh, you know, with Paulie. But I'll tell you my own story with Paulie. I, I can relate to what Curtis is saying, because when I was 20 or 21 years old, I was a recruit in the life. And uh, I had a, uh, a big market out in Long Island. And Andrew Russo, who was my captain at the time, he told me, uh, you know, you got to buy your, your poultry off of Paulie Castellano's guy. And uh, I said, okay, so we're buying poultry off of him. And it was Memorial Day weekend, I think. And we had a big order of chicken, you know, for a barbecue for some people over the weekend. So we get the chicken, I sell them to the woman. She comes back on Tuesday and said all the chicken had maggots in them. That's it. And I gave her her money back. It was a lot of money, I don't know, five, six hundred dollars at the time. It was a big, big deal that she had. So uh, I call up Paulie's guy, who happened to be his nephew or his cousin, I don't remember. It was another Castellano. And I said, look, I'm not paying for these chickens. They had maggots in them. He said, no, you're paying. One word led to another on the phone. He F's me. I F him. Boom. Right. I hang up on him. Next thing you know, I get a call from my capo at that time. He said, get to Brooklyn right away. I'm sitting with uh, Tom DeBella, who was the acting boss, and Andrew, and they tell me, tell me what happened with that phone call. So I tell him, and they said, you know whose chickens these are? I said, yeah. He said, well, you can't talk to that guy. That guy was a made guy. You know, you're only a recruit. You're going to get in trouble. We have a sit down with Paulie Castellano at that time, right? All of us. You would not believe the big deal that he made over five or $600 worth of chickens. Back and forth. I mean, he reamed me out. They told me, keep my mouth shut. Don't say anything because, you know, I wasn't in his position, obviously. But at the end of the day, I mean, I saw, I said, what is this guy over? He's actually sitting down with me. This is the boss of the Gambinos sitting down with me over five or six hundred dollars worth of chickens. And at the end of the day, I had to continue buying from him, but I didn't have to pay him for the for the bad batch of chicken. So that's how it went. I so, mean, but, but know, that I sounds right unbelievably of- petty and stupid, to be honest with you. It's almost so petty that that what Curtis says about the Gambinos and, and about the Gottis rings true. It's like they 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 went the extra step when they didn't have to. Well, Castellano, look, he had that reputation on the street. I mean, he wasn't. From our perspective, from what I knew, he wasn't really a well-liked guy. I was in his company a couple of times, mostly at weddings and, you know, other meetings that we had where I was just, you know, sitting down listening. But uh, he wasn't my favorite guy, let's put it that way. He was known to be very, very greedy. So, you know, Curtis's story obviously uh, rings true to me, for sure. It's Michael Franzese, former mobster. He's an author. He's a motivational speaker. MichaelFranzese.com. It's Curtis Lewa, the founder of the Guardian Angels, 1979, an incredible talk show host who's taken a... A, a break, a sabbatical, if you will, to go and fix the greatest city in the country. And hopefully you'll be able to do that, Curtis. Uh, Sliwa4ny.com. I appreciate the both of you sitting down together. Um, when when uh, you became aware, Michael, uh, about uh, the, the Gambinos and the Gaudis having a problem with Sliwa, I'm guessing you were already out of the life, right? Yeah, I was at, at that point in time. I heard was about he talked it. about before then, though? Was he talked about at all? Were they? Is anybody in the, the organized crime family saying, yeah, this Guardian Angels guy is a problem, or that was way later. You know what? You know, with the Columbos, with us, I never heard anything really negative. I might have been words here and there, but uh, I never heard anything, you know, like people were upset with him or mad at him or, you know, wanted to kill him or anything like that. Never heard anything like that. And, you know, you said something about us not wanting to go after law enforcement. We didn't. I mean, it was hands off. We were told straight out, we don't want that kind of heat. You don't go after law enforcement. They do their thing. We do our thing. And that's how it goes. So um, and the only two times that I've mentioned this in the past 
that I know for a fact that there was a hit put out, um, or it was talked about, I shouldn't say it was definite, was definitely on Giuliani, and I think we spoke about that with, uh, with Rudy at that time, and believe it or not, at, uh, uh, what's his name, Geraldo Rivera. People didn't like Geraldo, and they were really talking about taking him out at one point in time. Obviously, it never happened. I mentioned that to him uh, when I was on the Hannity show with him, and uh, he turned white. I said, Geraldo, they really were going to take you out at one point in time. And he, he couldn't believe it. I said, well, come on, you know. You said a lot of things that upset people, so I guess, uh, you know, they were really pretty upset about it. But obviously, it never happened. Uh, Geraldo is a, has made a living off of making people angry and, and make them think. So uh, he shouldn't have been that surprised by it. It's, a, it's a Curtis Lee White. It's Michael Franzese. I really appreciate the, the two of you sitting down. Let's talk about the state of New York right now, the state of New York City right now. Michael, you've told the story now uh, about going through Times Square, surprised and stunned by how incredible it is. Now it's, it's crime-ridden. Now you've got people who are afraid to go to Times Square. Curtis, you have literally warned me, a guy from New York, you said, don't come here, Joe. Do not come right now. Don't bring your family. I'll let you know when it's safe again, and it's not right now. So in seeing the state that, is, that, that it's in, Curtis, first of all, let me start with you. What, what are you hoping to do? Because already your organization has done so much for the city. What are you hoping to do going forward should you become the mayor? Uh, um, and, and should you not? I mean, I hope that you do. But what happens to the future of New York City if something doesn't get done right now? Then, Michael, if you don't mind, I want your thoughts about what you see happening to New York from afar. Go ahead, Curtis. Well, Joe, as I told you, if you do come to New York, you need to wear a bulletproof body condom. I don't, uh, because, I don't want to wear that. Uh, I just don't want to wear it. It doesn't sound comfortable to me. I'm just going to put it out Well, there. look, the diapers on our face, right? You right. can wear a bulletproof body condom. Because you have these random shootings between competing gangs or emotionally disturbed persons. It's not about being in the wrong place at the wrong time and you knew it might get hot and heavy there. You're in the gateway to, the, to America, to New York, Times Square, and people are shooting guns at one another. And simply because we have a mayor named de Blasio who is in a drug-induced psychosis, must be smoking too much Maui Waui and Hindu Kush, you know, with his wife going puff puff fast at night, because he has put handcuffs on the cops. They are reactive, not proactive. They don't do any physical interventions. There's nothing, there's no undercover units who can smell guns, who can smell gangs, and that's what they're trained to do. So that criminals have a license to commit crime, and then there's a no bail issue. So you could get, you could actually get uh, locked up for possession of a loaded handgun, which technically should give you three and a half years, right, for that. And you're remanded not to jail with bail, you're put right back out on the streets, and naturally you're thinking you hit lotto and Powerball, so you just go out and become a predicate offender, and you do it again and again and again. And so there's uh, no law and total disorder, and we're starting to move back in the time machine towards the 70s and 80s, and that's why I decided to get into this race, right. because I am law and order. You cut my veins in arteries, I am New York. And I know how to deal with gangs, and I know how to deal with those who are bent on committing crimes, and you got to do it with a fist. You got to be hard. You know, long term, there can be some holistic measures. You know, you get them job training, you get them out of that life. But initially, it's like triage. You got to stem the flow of blood because right. the tourists are not going to come. People are going to continue their exodus down to Florida and other states. And more importantly, people are not going to invest in the crown jewel of America, New York City, which is the economic engine of the world. But I have a feeling. It's not going to remain that way if crime continues to move at its pace without allowing the police to do the job that they were sworn to do. And as mayor, I'm going to allow the cops to be cops again. Michael, you and I have talked um, off off the air as much as we've talked on the air, to be honest, and you have a great love for New York. I have a great love for New York. We believe it's the greatest city going. But as Curtis said, we're starting to see crime like we saw in the late 70s into the mid 80s. It's almost as if we turned a time machine on and we purposely have defunded the police. We purpose, And I'm not asking you about politics. You know that. I'm just asking you about your love of the city and what, what you see happening from afar. And know you still have people who live there uh, and what you hope to happen. You know, I mean, listening to Curtis now, it's, it makes me even more sick than I am. And I'm watching it from afar from out in California, but I read the papers every day. I read the New York Post and other New York papers. I mean, it's sickening what's going on. I love that city. I just don't understand the insanity of what people are thinking. Defund the police. I did eight years. I was a criminal, uh, Joe. I did eight years in criminal with other hardcore criminals. 
they're laughing. They're, I mean, it's, it's so insane to think that you can keep law and order in any other way than by enforcing the law through the police department and through law enforcement. It's insane. I don't know what these people are thinking. I had my daughter move out of the city. I mean, you know, I have a little granddaughter there. She lived in the city for 10 years. My little granddaughter, seven years old, they moved out to Long Island. She didn't want to take the kid outside the house. I mean, this is insanity, insanity. And it makes me sick because I do love the city. It is one of the greatest cities in the world. But look, it's happening all over the country. I read what's happening in Portland, Oregon, in Seattle, you know, in other places. In Chicago is a war zone. I happen to love that city. I have a lot of friends there. What they're telling me what's going on there, it's crazy. I don't know what these people are thinking. I almost taken it personal, like you don't care about our people on the street, our families, our loved ones. Guys with guns in the middle of the street, you know, innocent bystanders, two-year-old kids getting shot just walking across the street. It's insanity. And, you know, Curtis, I really mean that. I mean, I, look, I, I don't know what I could do from afar, but if I was in New York, I'd be doing everything in my power to support you for mayor. I'd be convincing everybody we need law and order. And this is coming from an ex-mob guy, an ex-criminal. Because like I said, you know... <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what to, I get upset just talking about it, Joe. It's it's absolute insanity. Insanity. Well, it, it is. And, and uh, I, I love your passion for it. Curtis has passion, you know, to, to spare. And I've got a lot of passion for the city as well. But the last time I was there and I talked to Curtis about this, I did feel safe. I felt okay. I felt like I can do, I, I was walking two miles uh, each way to go to the studio, whatever it was. And, and, and I was carrying a computer. I didn't worry about it. And, and Curtis, you literally, are, look, we saw a video just in the past few days. One guy's taken a dump in a janitor's bucket just on, in Times Square or something or, or Madison Square Garden, somewhere, Penn Station. And then uh, yesterday there's a video of a guy takes out a gun out of his little fanny pack or whatever, shoots a guy and kills him who's riding by on a bike. I'm not sure I understand what's going on, but it's not slowing down. The, I, I'm guessing that we're seeing fewer stories than are really happening there because the media controls the narrative from there. They can't hide everything. But is it worse than we even know? Well, you know, Joe, uh, we have now the phenomenon that we never had before drive-by shootings. So even when the mob had their mob wars and the Columbos, uh, Michael knows well, were at each other's throats, shooting at one another, they weren't doing drive-by shootings. That was actually created by a Brooklynite during the days of prohibition when Al Capone went to Chicago, helped take over the mob there and started using drive-by shootings in the 30s. My father was from Chicago. He told me that. And then the L.A. gangs are synonymous with drive-by shootings. We never had them before. That's because the cops, the undercover cops would stop cars. They toss guys out of there. You know, they could be smoking a joint. They could be drinking a brewski. The moment they'd stop you or it could be a taillight that wasn't working or too much tinted glass. And they toss the whole car and they'd be taking guns off the streets galore because, you know, we have a pipeline right into the city of illegal handguns that are coming in from surrounding states. But they took that anti-crime street crime unit off the streets and believe it or not, they they repurposed them and they have uniform police officers in non-marked cars patrolling neighborhoods like these guys slinging drugs and carrying nine millimeters aren't going to be able to spot 5 a cop right. from a mile away. Right. Come on. You see. The politicians who have rendered the cops impotent have never been in the belly of the beast, have never been in the inner city where gangs rule, Bloods, Crips, and all their different sets. You got to understand the mind of the gangbanger to understand how to preemptively stop them. Just like when organized crime controlled so many neighborhoods in the city and they were having their own internal battles. Finally, people said enough is enough. Rudy Giuliani came to the forefront and took out all five heads of organized crime. And they never, ever maintained the strength that they had at that point. People said it couldn't be done, and Rudy did it. And then there was a trickle-down effect. Now, because there's no legal gambling, they're still right. able to make money there, prostitution, some other things. But they've been rendered impotent. But it all started with Rudy Giuliani. He took a wrecking ball to organized crime, a wrecking ball to street crime in New York City, and now they're disparaging like Kumbada Cheech, Rudy Giuliani. It is uh, Curtis Sliwa, Sliwa4ny.com. Go there and check out the website. Michael Franzis, michaelfranzis.com. Uh, Michael, one last question on that. I know that you guys are both very busy, and I appreciate you, you giving so much time as you have. But but I've got to ask you this. You and I spoke about this before, and I don't remember if it was on the air or off the air. you become a dear friend, and I appreciate your time always. You said something that really jumped out at me, that the, the 
culture of crime and the leniency of law enforcement back in the 70s and 80s really did create a vacuum that the the mob could walk into. The Cosa Nostra only had the opportunity to really succeed and be as big as it was. I mean, you were stealing billions of dollars in tax money. Uh, you were only able to do that because of the, lax, the, the laxness of the crime fighting on the streets. Do you see something like that possibly happening again? Can these mob families rise again, knowing that the police are afraid to do their jobs? They have no support in City Hall. Criminals are running rampant in the streets. Can crime, from an organized sense, sprout back up in New York? Joe, let me... I mean, this is such... It, it's just common sense. When I was on the street back in the 70s and 80s, they had, I think, 1,200 to 1,400 FBI agents that were on all five families. And on all five families, we had about 750 made guys, guys that actually took the oath, obviously a lot of associates. They were still handcuffed because they didn't know how to use the racketeering law until Giuliani came in. But 1,400 agents, how would we feel If we found out, like what we know now, I believe there's about 100 agents that are on all five families. I mean, we'd be be dancing in the streets saying, hey, you know, there's no way they're going to cover us like they did before. It's the same way on the street. You know what Curtis just said? I, I mean, I get personally offended. I'm a convicted felon, even though my last conviction was, you know, 30 years ago. If I get caught with a gun in my house to protect myself, I'm facing 15 years. And I'm not going to use it for any other reason other than to protect myself. I want to make it clear, I don't have a gun in my house. I don't want to get raided. Right. But I'm just saying, if I had one, I'd get 15 years. These guys are walking the streets with guns. And the next day, they get arrested and they get let back out on the street. It's, it's just insanity what's going on. How do these people in office now believe that they're going to maintain a better atmosphere, have less crime without enforcement? I don't get it. I don't know what their mentality is. And this is coming from an ex-criminal. I mean, I, I just don't understand what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to prove. I'm trying to get, you know, and say to myself, well, where in their thinking does this make any kind of sense? And I can't reason with it, Joe. So, so, it, so, I mean, if I'm hearing you right, it is ripe. I mean, the crime families, as disorganized as they are now, are rubbing their hands together going, hey, we have one-twelfth of the amount of people watching us anymore. Why don't we take advantage of it? I mean, I believe so. I mean, that would be the mentality. I, I will say this, they're playing it low-key. You know, there was a time in New York, and Curtis, you'll remember this, you couldn't read the paper without a story about the mob every single day. Daily News, New York Post. Now, maybe every six months you'll read something. So they're playing it low key, you know, guys are staying undercover, they're being a little smart in that way. But I'm telling you this, you know, this thing normally goes in phases. You know, for a a, a period of time, everything's gonna be about the mob, 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 they'll go after it. And And then they relax a little bit, and let's say terrorism becomes the focus of law enforcement, at least on the, uh, the federal level. And what happens, these guys start to build up again. And I think that's what's happening now. I don't know if it'll ever be the same as it was during what I consider the golden years from the 50s through the mid 80s. But I, I guarantee they're not laying still. Stuff is happening. There's no doubt about it. It's Michael Franzese. It's F-R-A-N-Z-E-S-E is how you spell the last name. MichaelFranzese.com. Go there. Become part of his crew. Check out his YouTube channel, which is quickly getting to almost a million of, of viewers now or sub, subscribers now. Curtis Sliwa, running for New York City mayor. Sliwa for NY.com. Great talk show host, the founder of the Guardian Angels. I didn't do this last time with Giuliani, Michael, and I, and I want to do it with, with Curtis. Uh, do you guys have any questions for each other before we get out of here? And we're going to do this in several parts on my radio show. And thank you both so much for sitting down. Curtis, anything for Michael? Yeah, I, I want to know uh, your father, Sonny. What was his sequel? P- Ponce de, de Leon's, uh, you know, uh, a special potion. He lived to 103 years old after doing all that time. And then I remember it was on the West Side Highway, outside of these strip joints. He's going up to these uh, bad boy Albanians, you know, like muscle heads, all, all testosterone and steroids. And they were afraid of him. They moved out of his way like the Red Sea moved out of the way for Moses. The guy was like an old out the cock in his 80s. What was it about your father that would put fear into the hearts of these big testosterone-driven steroid crazies with a muscle between both ears? Well, obviously reputation. You know, he, he had a reputation because he did whatever he said he was going to do. No doubt about it. And my dad was a hands-on guy. Uh, You know, one of the secrets was, Curtis, and I heard this from guys around him, and he kind of brought me up the same way. He was a true leader. 
meaning that people wanted to follow him. You know, I say anybody could be a boss, but a leader is somebody that people want to follow because he has that charisma, those characteristics. And my dad would never ask anybody to do anything that he wouldn't do himself and probably do it a lot better. And he knew it. He did a lot of work for the family, obviously, during, you know, when he was coming up. I will, I'll also tell you this, you know, the secret to his life when we were kids, my dad is a, he believed in vitamins to the nth degree. He used to chase us around the house with cod liver oil. He used to take 30 vitamins a day. One of his biggest problems in prison was he couldn't get his vitamins. You know, he would tell me, Mike, you got to talk to the, the unit manager. I said, Dad, you're in prison. You're, you're 60 years old. You look like 30. Don't worry about it. You know, but no, he wanted his vitamins. He lived to 103. You know, my, my mother used to tell me, because I used to say, ah, dad's in prison, he's doing all this time, they got him in lockdown. She used to tell me, your father is going to outlive me and just about everybody else around him. She, she said, he's got a clear head, and this is his makeup, and don't worry about it. And you know what? She, she was right. He died at 103. And I will tell you this, Curtis, I believe my father was pretty healthy at 103. Last February, he was taken into the hospital. He died within four or five days. I believe my dad had COVID. We didn't know about it too much then. It wasn't really released, but all of a sudden, you know, he had the breathing issue and boom, he was gone in four or five days at 103. But I think it was COVID and they didn't diagnose it at the time. But if it wasn't for that, he'd probably still be around. Joe, uh, he was known, Sonny, in the age of his 80s to do one-arm push-ups. One-arm yeah. push-ups. Come on. I couldn't do two-arm push-ups <laughs> at the age of 67. <laughs> And he's right. You, your dad was like uh, Jack LaLanne of his uh, time. LaLanne, who was like always into vitamins and always into isometrics and calisthenics. I'm going to get into vitamins right now. Michael, anything for Curtis before we go? Yeah, you know, Curtis, I, I don't know how, but any way that I would be able to support you, uh, believe me, I, I would do it because I appreciate what you're doing for the city that I love. And, uh, you know, we need you. We need you badly out there. I got family back there, a lot of family, and I want to see them safe. And, uh, you know, any way I could support you, just let me know. I mean, even from afar, I mean, I got some presence on social media. I'll do whatever I can. That's uh, not a question. That's just an endorsement. Michael, for the hipsters and millennials who really don't know what New York City was like. So they've come from Iowa, where there are more pigs than people, Idaho, where there are more potatoes than people. They need a little dose of reality that if we don't put the brakes on quick, if we don't impose law and order, it's going to be back to fear city. And there's no better person to let them know than you, Michael, because you speak to large groups of people. You have influence on people. They follow influencers. You can influence them to vote for Curtis Schlieber for mayor because I'm not tolerating any of this nonsense. It'll be zero tolerance, quality of life, broken windows theory. What worked in Giuliani's era will work in Sliwa's era. We just got to get those hipsters and millennials to understand what's happening here in the city because unfortunately they're hopelessly naive. They're intellectually stupid because they just have never had the kind of experiences that you did growing up in the other side of Brooklyn and I in Canarsie. And that's why it's so important we relate to them the dangers of what's happening now. Gentlemen, I, I appreciate the three of us getting together. Thank you so much for giving me your time. You're both dear friends of mine. Uh, Curtis, I wish you nothing but the best in your run for New York City mayor. He's the Republican nominee. Sliwa 4 nycom Sliwa, F-O-R-N-Y.com. Michael Franzese is an incredible, uh, just a guy who's a guide for me now. You know, at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, I'll shoot him a text, and he's always there for me, and it has a, a, a very strong word, a very supportive word. Two guys that came from two different sides of the law, both on the same side now, looking for, for a better better country and a better and a better New York City michaelfranzese.com michael franzese is f r a n z e s e.com go join his crew check out his youtube channel gentlemen thanks so much i really appreciate you thank you thank you joe and curtis thank you and I, you got my commitment i'll be endorsing you and and pushing you in every which way i can we you know, need joe you. i know you got a lot of mobsters out there and former mobsters <laughs> watching Hey, Gotti Jr. out there in Oyster Bay, I don't forgive, I don't forget. You better hope I don't become mayor, because if so, you better move out of this country, pal. He laid it down. There it is right there. Gentlemen, thank you so much. It's an honor. Well, there you have it. Here was two guys coming from two different places in life, Curtis Sliwa, Michael Francis. But once again, you know, I support what he's running for mayor of New York because we need to clean up that city. 
I love New York, and to see what's going on now, it's kind of a throwback to the 70s, and that's when the city was not in good shape. Times Square was a, a pornography-strewn district. You didn't even want to go there. Got to give the credit to Rudy Giuliani, who really cleaned it up and made it the theater district again. And uh, New York, unfortunately, is now reverting back to the way it was in the 70s. Dangerous in a lot of places there. We need somebody like Curtis to come in and clean it up. He's running for mayor. I'm gonna support him, I'm telling you right now. I'm gonna support him because I love the city and we need somebody like him. So, hope you enjoyed it. You know, comments, you know, bring him in, good, bad, and different. You know, we love to see him. And uh, I'll leave you with this, michaelfrancis.com. My crew is growing in leaps and bounds. Why? Because people are getting a great experience out of it. Join.michaelfrancis.com, my inner circle. People are enjoying it. It's growing again because we're giving you a lot of content, a lot of personal contact with me, and we're encouraging people. We're giving them life skills, leadership skills, business advice. Got to join. Join.michaelfrancis.com. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Be safe. Be healthy. God bless you all. And yes, I will see you next time.